Excellent. Thank you everyone very much for joining us today for the virtual training session on using the GIS inventory for mutual aid planning and data sharing. This virtual training is being conducted uh, in partnership between the NAPSIG Foundation and the National States Geographic Information Council. This uh, virtual training is also being recorded today and a recorded version will be made available on NAPSIG's website uh, within a few days following today's session. A couple of administrative notes I'd like to mention is that all question and answers will be handled directly through the WebEx question and answer feature. There will be approximately 10 minutes held aside at the end of today's session to cover all questions and answers that arise during today's session. The other important point I'd like to mention is that today's session is, is designed to address two very important communities, the GIS technical community that provides support in mapping products to the public safety operators and decision makers that work in the field every day. So we will be working to address needs and requirements and perspectives from both of those angles on today's session. And with that, I'll get us started uh, with some instructor introductions. First, I'd like to introduce to you Bill Burgess, the Washington liaison with the National States Geographic Information Council, NISGIC. Bill, if you could just take a few moments and share a few words about yourself and your background as it relates to GIS and the role of GIS in emergency management and mutual aid. Bill, over to you. Okay. Um, well, I was a career State of Maryland employee uh, in the Department of Natural Resources and retired in 2003. During that period, for 11 years, I was a state's on-scene commander for oil and hazardous material spills and uh, also worked with Anne Arundel County Fire Department at Cape St. Clair uh, in the early to mid-80s uh, to help them get started up with their hazardous materials team. So I'm pretty familiar with the uh, first responders' role. Uh, since 2003, I've been the Washington liaison for NISJIC, um, working uh, out of my house actually on the eastern shore of Maryland. And I work with the federal agencies. I also work with a little bit with Congress in our advocacy efforts and then certainly coordinate throughout the states. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. And we're very excited to have you today as one of our key instructors. The other instructor I'd like to introduce briefly is Stone, uh, Tony Speechy. Tony is the Technical Information Specialist and is on the Planning Team Manager for Missouri Urban Search and Rescue, or USAR, Task Force One. Tony, if you could share a few words about your role and experience at GIS as it relates to your work with USAR and mutual aid, that would be great. Thanks, Tony. Over to you. Um, yes. Good Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, like Bill, I've got a, a background both in state government and the emergency uh, services field. I've been a volunteer firefighter for a little, little less than 30 years uh, now, so ever since I've, I turned 18. So I, I try not to do the math anymore because it gets depressing, but uh, it's been a bit. And then um, I was a founding member of Missouri Task Force One, uh, an organization that's part of the federal USAR system, and I think we've been around for about 15 years or so. Um, both of those are volunteer roles. Um, my full-time role, I'm a, a, a GIS coordinator for the state of Missouri, um, and I've spent pretty much all of my professional career working with uh, GIS at the state level. So my professional background is in uh, geospatial data. My volunteer experience is in uh, USAR and, and the fire service, and um, I try to bring those two together. Um, and enhance the work I do with uh, Task Force One uh, through my experience with GIS. Excellent. Thank you, Tony. And we appreciate you joining us today and your perspective during today's training session. Uh, I just take a quick moment to introduce myself. I'm Rebecca Harnett. I'm a senior program manager with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. And I've been with the organization for about seven years. And I've uh, had quite a bit of experience working on mutual aid issues, mostly at the local level, but uh, also in the past couple of years I've had some interaction with state-to-state -state mutual aid in the EMAC program. Uh, and I'm really excited about today's opportunity to help bridge that perspective between the GIS community and, and the data elements as they relate to enhancing preparedness and readiness for mutual aid. 
Great. So before we get started in today's content, for those of you who are new to our organizations, we're going to give a quick overview of who we are. And I'll start with NAPSIG and then hand it over to Bill to cover NISJIC. So the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. We represent a uh, practitioner network of over 6,500 uh, local, state, tribal, uh, federal, practitioners that are both public safety operators and decision makers, and also GIS, technical GIS specialists and planners. Our, our mission is to equip the emergency management and public safety community at large with the knowledge, skills, and resources to apply decision support technology and data in enhancing preparedness and building a more resilient a nation. And the, certainly one of the ways that we do that equipping with knowledge and skills is through virtual trainings, in-person workshops, um, but virtual trainings like the one that you're participating in today. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bill to give a quick overview of the National States Geographic Information Council. Bill? Yeah, thanks. Um, we promote statewide geospatial coordination activities uh, throughout the states, and we work as an advocate for the states and national geospatial policy initiatives and programs. Uh, and what we try to do is design statewide geospatial infrastructures that will then support a national spatial data infrastructure. Um, our goals are really to provide a unified voice uh, for the states in these technology issues, and we advocate for the state's interests with the federal government and with Congress, and we also provide support services to our membership, and one of those support services uh, is the GIS inventory that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're a 501c6 organization, and that registration means that we are allowed to advocate with Congress. Uh, and we do a little bit of that uh, from time to time. Uh, and I think I'm going to stop there, Rebecca. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that background. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about today's, the purpose of today's virtual training session. So this session is really int intended to provide you all with awareness level training on the features in the GIS inventory and discuss how it can be used to enhance mutual aid planning and readiness across all levels. So provided here are the four key uh, objectives of our session today. Uh, so we will cover some of the information and you'll actually get a live demonstration of the features that are currently available in the GIS inventory. Um, we'll also give you a glimpse into what new features will be coming available in version 7 uh, that's slated to be released uh, in just a couple of months. But we'll also talk quite a bit about how to use the GIS inventory and why to use the GIS inventory to aid your agency and community's preparedness and mutual aid efforts. And we'll even talk about some of the best practices from the field and give real world examples for how the GIS inventory can be and should be applied as a data sharing tool and also as a preparedness tool for mutual aid and planning efforts. Before we go into today's session, I did want to cover a few key pieces of terminology that you will see uh, kind of throughout today's uh, session, you will hear, so that everyone's on the same page about what it is we're talking about. So one of those key pieces of, of terminology is the GIS inventory. So provided here is a very basic definition. It is a web-based system for inventorying and tracking data availability and the status of GIS implementation uh, in state and local government, and that obviously includes county government. You'll soon see actually what the GIS inventory is and be provided with a link to be able to access it. The other important definition, since uh, it can certainly mean many different things to many different people, is what is mutual aid. So very plain and simple, a mutual aid is the arrangements made to request and receive assistance across political and social subdivisions. So it can be across tribal nations, it can be across townships, boroughs, counties, any any type of political subdivision uh, in the United States and beyond. And then you're also going to hear this idea of data sharing, which we all know is a, it's kind of become a buzzword amongst our respective community. And so really short and easy, it, what we're looking at data sharing is the process of making data available to others. And you'll actually see today what it is we mean by that when we look into the GIS inventory. 
You'll also see some more technical terms. So we've provided these for, for those of you who are joining us who, who may not have much of a technical bend um, or, or vocabulary, just to make sure we're all, all talking about the same thing and provide you with that basic level information. So one of those key terminology is REST services, and you'll hear that referred to uh, when you take a look at some of the new features that will be available in the GIS inventory. So in a technical perspective, it's a software architecture and style consisting of guidelines and best practices for creating scalable web services. So many mapping and many GIS applications are available as web services, which would essentially use REST services um, to support and provide information into those mapping products. ISP or Internet Service Provider, that's essentially your your Comcast or whatever your whoever provides you your your uh, actual internet uh, within your community. And then we have RAID. Uh, RAID is a data storage virtualization technology that combines multiple disk drive components into a single unit. And it, really the important thing here is the data redundancy. So from a cont continuity of operations standpoint, RAID capabilities are good because they, they maximize um, the preparedness from a continuity standpoint. In the case that a system were to go down, there's a level of redundancy there. And last but not least, uh, we've got two other pieces of key terminology we wanted to mention to you. One is JSON, uh, which is JavaScript Object Note Notation, uh, which is a lightweight data interchange format. And it's easy for us people to read and to write. Um, and it's also easy for machines to consume and process. And so we'll be talking about how that relates to the GIS inventory a little bit later. And then we'll also mention something called Bootstrap, um, which is a popular framework, and the important thing here is its relationship in, in, in how the GIS inventory is evolving to be able to support its use in mobile applications on the web. So uh, at the end of today's session, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So a really quick overview of our training agenda before I hand it over to Bill. First, we'll be providing you with an overview of the GIS inventory, some basic background information. We'll, we'll then cover a use case scenario of the use of GIS inventory within the context of urban search and rescue with Tony Speechy talking about his, his use uh, within Missouri Task Force One. We'll also put a more general uh, perspective around how and why the GIS inventory is important to support enhanced mutual aid. And then we'll delve into a live demonstration of the current version of the GIS inventory to give you an idea and walk you through how you can use it. And at the end, we will review the new data sharing features in the GIS inventory and talk about what they mean for public safety. And the last 10 minutes of our day today will be dedicated to questions and answers that will be taken through the WebEx question and answer feature. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Bill Burgess to cover the system information and a couple of other key aspects on the, mutual aid, uh, on the GIS inventory. Bill, over to you. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, and one point I'd like to make up front is that all the work that we do with the GIS inventory is actually funded through the Department of Homeland Security uh, with a contractual arrangement uh, that we have with them. Uh, they believe in you know, the activities that we're engaged in and we move our data over to systems that they can access. Uh, so it's very important in the big picture and working between local, state, and federal agencies. Uh, GIS inventory is a dedicated system. Uh, that means it's a dedicated server that sits on an internet service provider site uh, out actually in Michigan. Uh, it's developed and managed uh, wholly by NISJIC. Uh, we are the only ones that modify this system. Uh, as Rebecca mentioned earlier, uh, we do have RAID drive configuration that helps ensure uptime. Uh, we don't guarantee 24-7, uh, 365, but in fact, we do have about a 99.9% uh, uptime uh, over the course of the last uh, six or seven years. Uh, there's always something that can potentially take you down, but we do everything possible to make sure that we are 24-7. Uh, the RAID drives actually allow the system to rebuild the data if one of the hard drives uh, goes bad while it's in operation and the users don't even notice it. 
Uh, we also have onboard backup of the system data, and I do daily remote backups of the system data at my office uh, location. And we're currently operating on version 6, and that's what we're going to show you today. But we're also planning the release of version 7 uh, anywhere from the next week to three or four weeks out. And I'm going to give you just a, a couple of um, pieces of information on the new version uh, about the main features uh, that you'll see differences in. Next slide. Okay, uh, we currently have about 5,400 registered users in the system. Uh, you don't need to be a registered user uh, in order to access the system and use the features. But if you're going to inventory uh, your data or map services, then you do need to be a registered user. And I'll show you where you do that on the system. Uh, currently, we have about uh, 23,500 data layers uh, identified in the system. Uh, we need a lot more. Uh, and much greater participation. What we'd like to ideally see is every county in the country and every state agency uh, have an inventory of something like 30 to 100 or more uh, data layers in the system. So that's part of the reason we're talking to you today. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, kind of a fundamental question, and this is you know the real purpose of today's training is to pose some issues to you in regard to mutual aid support, uh, and we'll walk through some of these. Uh, so fundamentally, does this community want to continually chase the newest technology, or does it want to use an established platform that will meet its basic requirements? And where I'm going with this is that the geospatial community, like all information technologies, tends to move very quickly to new technologies and frequently abandon previous efforts, and we've seen this in many national systems. Uh, and it basically delays our efforts to really implement national systems when we do that. Uh, we believe that we need stability and framework systems uh, in order to effectively work together. Next slide. The GIS inventory is typically one to two years uh, behind the latest technologies and its development cycles. Uh, it's a very complex system uh, that we've put up, and in order to chase these newest technologies, uh, it really takes about a year's lead time uh, to integrate them into the system, get them fully tested in four or five different web browsers uh, and uh, different operating systems. And uh, so it's a process. Uh, so we do not immediately turn over to the next technology but we do incorporate them uh, based on those trends in the industry and what the um, users tell us that they need. Uh, part of the problem with the newer technologies and trends, and you may have seen them in your offices, is that uh, you can bring a young person in, maybe fresh out of college, and they've got the latest training. Uh, they have a chance to do a lot of things, and they can show you some really remarkable things that they're able to do with IT technology. Uh, we can't turn that fast uh, into the new technologies. So we're looking for reliability in this system. We want it to be bulletproof. Uh, and in order to do that, it's really difficult, and stability is a challenge. Uh, and we've put a lot of time and effort into that stability of the system. Next slide. Okay. Um, I guess the way I would liken the participation in the GIS inventory is like when I first learned CPR, uh, I'm not the smallest guy in the world, and my instructor looked at me and he goes, you know you're not here to save yourself. And uh, you all may have been in the same situation. Uh, but you're not going to participate in the GIS inventory typically for your own reasons. Um, you're going to know about your own data and the resources that you've got within your organization. But frequently, and as we talk about some of these use cases in a minute on USAR and mutual aid, others need to know about your data and your map services. And you can't just expect that they're going to be able to find them at any point in time. So if you inventory your data and your map services, you're going to help support mutual aid, uh, more efficient operations, maybe even just across a countywide enterprise. 
Uh, you're going to support effective planning activities, and you're going to establish a protocol that will allow local, state, and federal agencies to communicate and work together effectively. Next slide. All right, so, you know, bottom line uh, graphic is participating in the GIS inventory uh, increases preparedness uh, at a local to national level and then provides improved value to the participants. And it's just kind of a continuous cycle that we're talking about here. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Tony Speechy to talk about uh, the urban search and rescue. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bill, for that overview. In a few minutes, you'll hear from Bill when you actually see a live demonstration. But before we do that, we're going to have Tony Speechy provide us with an actual use case scenario. What does something like the GIS inventory mean in context with first responders and public safety? And so he's going to provide us a view from the urban search and rescue perspective in Missouri Task Force One. So, Tony, over to you. Okay. Next slide, please. Can you hear me? No, there we go. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the uh, National USAR system, there's 24 task forces uh, basically deployed uh, whenever a disaster occurs. Uh, we can be pre-deployed um, in anticipation of a, of a disaster that's typically a hurricane or sometimes national events of significance like uh, presidential or um, the, the governmental, uh, the Democrat and Republican conventions. Um, we generally don't know where we're going, uh, typically, because disasters strike without warning. Um, and even if we're being sent to a hurricane response as part of pre-deployment, we may not necessarily know where we're going to go within that zone, because they'll typically deploy at least three task forces. So um, we could be sent directly into the path, or we could be sent one or two states over, uh, just depending on where they want to send us. Um, obviously, maps and geospatial information are critical to our deployments. Um, from the time that we're, we're deployed and we need to get in route uh, to the uh, time that we finish up the after action plan, um, what we did and where we did it are, are critical components. And so we're actually starting to, to, to develop and, and chew up map data and geospatial data right from the, the actual notification for the federal government. Um, and because our response area is quite literally the entire United States, um, we need to rely on other data sources uh, to get that information and get it quickly because we just, it's not feasible for us to catalog all that information. Next slide, please. The um, case uh, study that they wanted to use for this uh, particular training exercise was the Missouri Task Force One activation for Hurricane Sandy. So our activation took place after the hurricane had already come and, and gone through. Uh, we were activated at the end of October. Uh, we were basically underway in, within about 12 hours. We, we left on the 30th, but it was about 1 a.m. So a uh, relatively quick turnaround doesn't give you uh, a lot of time. It, it takes us about five to six hours to get everything loaded up and ready to go. Uh, we drove basically all through the night through the next day. We arrived at McGuire Air Force Base, and uh, we were actually out working in the area on the 1st of November, but uh, we started getting our first assignments on November 2nd. Next slide, please. Um, during this response, our, our primary mission was humanitarian. Um, as I said, the, the hurricane had come and gone, but there were uh, a, a large number of um, individuals that had decided to stay in place for various reasons. The uh, FEMA wanted us to assess uh, where those folks, folks were and what those needs were. So we're not doing any life safety missions, which is our primary role, but rather basically going out and collecting information. All of that information was geospatial. Um, FEMA wanted us to collect an address point. They were not able to give us any data in advance, uh, nor were they able to provide any data in route or while we were there. Uh, so we were essentially left on our own. Uh, during our deployment, we covered 34 miles of streets, um, approximately 4,200 homes, and contacted 3,500 citizens. Uh, a large number of citizens had moved out of the area, but those without means had remained there. Uh, for those of you familiar with the Northeast, our area, of our search area, was um, in a number of different locations. 
including um, Long Beach, New York, which is on Long Island, um, and Lawrence, New York, which is on Long Island. So um, both were very different neighborhoods. Both were probably a dozen to two, but, but maybe a dozen miles apart. Um, but, you know, basically we were in a very heavily urbanized area, um, but we were in a number of different municipalities. Next slide. From a data perspective, um, our biggest issues were really the, uh, from a geospatial standpoint, the uh, ability to get data. Um, none of this data, very little data was available online. Um, there was virtually nothing in the GIS inventory to at least give us the benefit of being able to make phone calls or, or begin to identify what the data was and where it was available. Um, we had some agencies like Nassau County that were glad to give us the parcel data, which was critical to our role, but we would have to sign a data agreement. And so they said, yeah, just come on down to our offices when you get a chance and, and uh, we'll make things happen, not realizing that that's not something that we can very easily do. Um, so it really limited and, and hampered. The other area that we were really, really struggling was um, our access to actual maps. Each day we were given um, an assignment. We, what our task force did, there was about 80 of us, um, and we would break down into teams of about five folks so that we could maximize our search grid and, and move as efficiently as possible. And so we were given areas to search. Uh, if we were lucky, we received one map. It was typically our zone assignment. Um, and we had to try to share that one map among however many crews we'd sent out in the field, which was typically, you know, about eight to ten. Uh, as, a, as a tech info officer, one of my roles was to get, make that information available to our, our um, teams, and we struggled to be able to do that. We did not have very good uh, access to the Internet, um, partially because of our mobility. We moved around. We staged in a lot of different areas, but also because of the impact of the infrastructure. There were a lot of places that either the, the Internet was unavailable or it was so jammed with folks. Um, that we couldn't pull information across. And again, we just, we didn't have a way to get data. Um, and the other, the other big issue there was a lot of times they would say, this is the information you need for the area you're, you're going to search today. And by 10 o'clock in the morning, we had already searched that entire area. Uh, so we were moving to other areas that were given to us as we finished. Um, so we were going into areas that we were unfamiliar with. Uh, which created a lot of um, problems when, again, we're assigned a search area and we don't have basic map information. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, the opportunities that came out of this, uh, in other words, you know, our, our response to the challenge, um, is more than anything else, there just needs to be a bigger awareness between urban search and rescue, um, the, the mutual aid response community, and, and the locals as well. Um, the inability for local folks to provide data to us for various reasons, including some of these licensing agreements, was, was challenging and I think unnecessary. Uh, we had very similar problem in New Orleans uh, with Katrina. Um, uh, it, no desire to share that information to the, the mutual aid and, and first responders that had come from outside of the area because we were quote unquote uh, outsiders. Um, mutual aid uh, agreements can include uh, data agreements. I do understand that a lot of local municipalities and governments have restrictions on their data and how it's used, um, but common sense would say some of those restrictions uh, would be removed in the event of a, a natural disaster and or a situation where, where lives aren't threatened or lives are threatened. Now that I'm not talking about data that has privacy concerns, I'm talking about addresses and parcels. Uh, information such as that does not need to be um, kept out of the hands of first responders, nor should we be expected to pay large sums of money to use it in a, in a crisis like this. Uh, GIS inventory is absolutely critical um, because it allows us, uh, typically speaking, we do not fly anymore. The military just doesn't have the transport, so we drive. Um, and we do have time on the front end of a deployment um, to actually get online if we can get Internet access and grab that information, even if it's just the, um, the contact information that's available in the GIS inventory, which allows us to know what data is available and how we go about getting that data. Um, you know, again, a lot of times it'd be nice to have everything available online, but there are times when that's not an, uh, an option. So the ability to make a phone call uh, or contact somebody and say, hey, this is the information we need. Can we meet somewhere and get it? Um, 
All their opportunities provide statewide map books here in Missouri. Um, we have a, a map book system that we were able to deploy when uh, Joplin, Missouri was hit by an F5 tornado. Uh, the damage path was, I uh, believe, the F5 portion of the tornado alone was nine miles. So the damage was extensive and widespread. Uh, our state uh, EOC was able to provide our task force with map products uh, as we were going out the door, which, which proved to be highly successful. Um, and then, you know, again, um, making GIS professionals available to USAR uh, teams and similar teams that respond in these events. Um, if you have local government GIS professionals, especially outside the affected area, that could come in and provide that information. Um, very, very helpful. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think Great. that's my slide. Oh, nope, that's yeah, not my uh, slide. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Thank you very much, Tony. Yep. I, I think the perspective you shared is very valuable um, and really put this into context uh, for us with, with that real world example around Hurricane Sandy, but also certainly with Joplin. So uh, really great example. Thank you. And for those participants that might have any follow on questions for Tony regarding those, feel free to start entering those into the question and answer um, feature within WebEx, but do know that we'll be taking all questions and covering all questions at the end of today's session. And so with that, what I'd like to do is just transition into talking about from a, a broad or more gen general standpoint about the application of GIS and mutual aid. And uh, Bill Burgess has teed up a few slides for us today, uh, but certainly this goes back to that bottom line slide where we had the graphic of the three boxes in terms of what we're talking about and how the use of the GIS inventory is a key preparedness and readiness activity in building resilience. So Bill, over to you to cover these slides. Good, thank you. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, your day-to-day -day business, and that's mutual aid. Uh, we all know that local and state resources are requested and deployed every day, uh, be it an adjoining jurisdiction or maybe across the state or even to adjoining states routinely. Uh, in many cases, uh, the responders are deployed through mutual aid and rely on their own organization for initial mapping support, and that's especially true, like in the case of what Tony showed you, uh, pre-deployment and early into your deployment before you get fully integrated into the command structure at the event. Uh, the responders there will then typically receive map products provided by the requesting agency uh, to support their mission. Next slide. Okay, uh, one use case that I'll actually be able to show you in the GIS inventory is wildland fire uh, fighting. Uh, we have one feature built in specifically to support this activity. Uh, and in this case, resources are typically requested and deployed nationwide to assist with suppression activities. And in this simple example, this is a map I clipped off the uh, national system, uh, I think two days ago. Uh, so we're showing maybe a crew going from Georgia out to Idaho. And while they're en route uh, to that deployment, uh, they can support their own operations so when they get on site, they're better prepared to deal with the incident. Next slide. Um, one point, uh, and again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but it's important to today's presentation, is a community in need of mutual aid assistance can be completely devastated and unable to provide that mapping support for arriving crews. So again, when you're deployed to an unfamiliar location, you may rely on your home organization uh, to support you in this way, to provide uh, maps and products uh, that will, again, make you knowledgeable about the local site. Next slide. And that's this example. Uh, being able to find and use geospatial data and map services in those unfamiliar areas allows you to be in control and knowledgeable about your surroundings. Next slide. I think we're going to be going into the live demo at this point. Oh, I'm We've sorry. We've got one more. one more slide. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the redundancy. Um, and again, continuity of operations uh, really requires redundancy. In that situation where a local jurisdiction may be out of business uh, because they've been devastated, uh, part of a system like the GIS inventory uh, helps them provide redundancy 
uh, and kind of failover uh, for their operations. And so a national tool like the GIS inventory is accessible to everyone. And in this case, uh, if I were to be deployed to the township of Vineland in New Jersey, uh, I can actually find uh, the fire hydrant locations. Uh, if I'm not able to interface with local crews or if they are not able to provide maps to us uh, in order to locate those types of resources. And we'll get into this exact example in a second here. So are you going to turn over the uh, presentation to me, Rebecca? Yes, you got it. So now we'll be going into a live demonstration of the GIS inventory. We'll just pause for a quick moment. And I'm actually going to pass the presenter privileges over to Mr. Burgess. Excellent. Okay, that's the turkeys in my backyard. <laughs> you got it. We can uh, see it. Thank you. Okay. So this is the GIS inventory interface. It's just gisinventory.net uh, that will take you there. Uh, homepage, and we just, uh, like our website, we move uh, photographs uh, from the individual states. Uh, they just rotate as you come in and out of the system. So I'm going to run across uh, the top, and you know, unfortunately, I'm going to have to fly through this. We're not here to train you on every feature of the GIS inventory today. We're here to get your interest in using it. So I'm going to run very quickly through the features uh, to give you an idea of what is here. The first would be a data layer search, a very simple uh, search box on keywords. So I might type in the word hydrant and hit a return, and I've got 32 results uh, for jurisdictions that have provided fire hydrant information typically although the word hydrant could show up in some other type of file that would not necessarily be fire hydrants. Uh, now, if I expand that search, and you'll notice that we have and or or terms uh, in the search. So if I put New Jersey, all of these words have to be in the record that I'm searching for. So now I'm narrowed down to two fire hydrant files. Uh, the first would be for the city of Vineland in New Jersey. And if I click on that link, it will take me to detailed information. Actually, let me zoom in a little bit on this to make it easier for you all to see some of this. Um, so I have the original source metadata, uh, and we didn't really talk much about metadata. It's a detailed file structure that allows systems to interchange data. And uh, I don't need to go into any more detail than that, but you know, here we have a title fire hydrants in the city of Vineland, New Jersey. And if I go back to the system, one thing is this is an imported record into the system. Uh, these um, records, uh, in many cases, can have very unusual names. We have an onboard thesaurus in the system to help convert uh, unusual file names to standardized names in our system. And this is one of the things that DHS actually likes about our system. Uh, for example, just ortho imagery. I can give you 40 different terms in a couple of minutes that people call ortho imagery. And unless you've got a good keyword uh, search capability or a thesaurus behind you, you may not find uh, ortho imagery that's actually documented in the system. So we normalize everything uh, to a particular data layer name and also to a category. There's 19 overarching categories. We append uh, our data layer name to your actual file name. And then we provide uh, the contact for the metadata, also the custodian of the data. And if we want to, we can go out to that organization's website. Uh, this is the New Jersey Geographic Information Network, where we'd be able to get access to more resources in that location. So that's kind of just a flavor of what you can do with a data search in the system. There is an advanced search tool that will allow you to refine and narrow down the search, but I'm not going to show you that today. Uh, the status map is comprised of three different map products. The first is a true status map. So if I go in and reset on imagery and base map cover, and then I select ortho imagery, uh, the map will show me where these files are uh, documented throughout the country. 
So it's a status picture of where we stand with this uh, particular type of data. Now this does not mean that these data don't exist in areas that they don't show up. Uh, it just means that they're not inventoried in those areas. Uh, there is a code based on colors. The data layers are either complete, they're in work, or they're planned down here in the lower left-hand corner. And the colors that display on the map will tell you the same thing, as well as the information here, how many data layers are in the system that are shown as complete ortho imagery products. Uh, so that's the status map. We have a search map also that, again, if I do this uh, hydrant and New Jersey, I can execute that search, and we're going to find those same two records. And the difference here is that if I move over to New Jersey, okay, you can see these two boxes. Uh, that are now active. Uh, so you can see the actual placement as opposed to just finding it in the data layer list. So if I click on one of these, okay, um, I get, uh, in this case, the fire hydrants in the city of Vineland, New Jersey, contact information, and again, I can go back and view uh, that form in the system that has links to take me out to other uh, locations. And one of the problems I'm going to have today is that uh, typically when we're running under WebEx, sometimes uh, click sensitive things uh, give us a little bit of a fit. So here I'm going to click on the name over on this side and it will actually zoom me right into that location uh, of that particular data layer. Another map feature that's in the system is the cadastral map. And again, I want to zoom in a little uh, on this to show you. The use case here is for wildland firefighting. Uh, we need to know where the parcels are that are improved so that we've got homes out in remote areas where we've got a wildfire moving into it. Uh, and that was the purpose of the National Cadastral Inventory uh, that's been done for a number of years by the uh, federal government. They provided their data to us for the viewing systems and for the data download systems. And we entered it into the GIS inventory. So you can go in, and I'm going to click in Montana, and you'll see that we get two URLs. Uh, in the case of Montana, they're actually both the same. I can view the data over on their site uh, for their location, or I can actually download the data from their site. Uh, and again, uh, visualize where improved parcels are across the country. So that's the three series of maps that we have under the status map tab. The next part of the system is my profile. You have to have an account that you've created in the system in order to get in here. And I'm just going to go ahead and sign into my account. We'll talk about how to create an account in a minute. Um, this is a series of different parts of the database. Uh, it's an organizational profile. Uh, your own contact information, systems profile, policies, uh, do you license copyright charge for data, will you share it with other government agencies, uh, your geography so we can establish those map boundaries uh, that show up in the system, and then uh, data layers in the system, and this is where you can go in and actually manually document, and I'm just going to take what's selected here. Our overarching uh, category is biota. Uh, the very first one is amphibian distribution and habitat. If I click on that, it's going to open a form that you can complete uh, the questions. It's really very simple. It takes anywhere from, I'd say, typically a minute to two minutes. And you can manually enter information about your data sets here. If I save it, it automatically becomes part of the system. I'm going to cancel out. Uh, we also have automated harvesting functions uh, that um, I have one set up here with a test of 16 or 18 records. Uh, I can show you what the account looks like. And this is when you already have metadata uh, according to the federal CSDGM standard. Uh, and I'll show you where to find more information on that uh, later or JSON now that we're newly supporting. 
uh, you can create an account to automatically harvest that type of data. And there's a full instruction set in the system to show you how to do this. Uh, this is all the information that you have to provide to the system, what you see on screen. And if I go in and view results, uh, this is a set of uh, 18 records that were automatically harvested that probably only took about 20 seconds uh, to get them over into the system. Uh, we've done files as large as uh, about 65,000 records. Uh, we took in all of NOAA, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's uh, data, and I think it came over into the system in about 45 minutes for 65,000 records. Uh, in this case, we have the automated information that came in. We need to manage it before we actually put it into the system. So this is information that came in from the Emergency Management Agency in Florida. Uh, their title for their data record is Base DBO Surge Zones. Uh, our onboard thesaurus has put that into the category of boundaries and into the data layer name of hurricane and tsunami inundation areas. Uh, so again, a standardized data layer name, and we just append uh, their data layer name also uh, in the system. There are certain pieces of information here that you can modify, including the geography if you want to. You would then check a box, and if you go back up and save your changes, those data records automatically move over into the system. Uh, another feature that we have is the ability to create APIs that you can install on your web pages that will come over and do uh, information requests to the GIS inventory. We've got a basic set of commands here. Uh, if you're going to set up APIs on your site, you have to have a key this is part of the reason you need to be a registered user to you know, get to this feature, uh, because the key is assigned to your account. Uh, and we know these are only basic commands. Uh, we will provide additional commands on request uh, if you make a support request. Uh, I'm going to move over next to the directory in the system. And uh, this is basically a very simple interface. Uh, I can put in, you know, a name, an organization name, a location, state, uh, a zip code if I put in 21629, and I say that uh, within 50 miles of that zip code, I want to find uh, everybody in the system that does emergency management. I need to do the CAPTCHA, and then I can execute that search. Okay, and it's showing me that. So all of these people are within 50 miles of the zip code that I live in, and they are all registered as users that are involved in emergency management. So the directory is a really straightforward feature of the system. We also have a couple of other features. Uh, the About uh, pages uh, gives you quite a bit of background information on the GIS inventory. We have a series of getting started guides that will walk you through each of the individual features of the system, including a video uh, tutorial for the basic functions of the system. Uh, and then we have one last feature that is the public safety page with a series of other websites with information that might be important to you all, including uh, information on NAPSIG and their CARAT system. And then the last thing that you need to know is that we do have support requests uh, we ask you to look at the Getting Started Guides and uh, review them. If you can't find what you need or you're still having problems, you can open the support ticket. Uh, you have to fill out the CAPTCHA code and then submit that request, and it will come to two of us. And uh, we're not staffed 24-7, uh, but the two of us that do this uh, pretty much are insomniacs, and we tend to work on the weekends. So you will typically get a response uh, well past business hours. Uh, from the system. So that's all I wanted to show you on the existing system. Uh, and Rebecca, I guess we need to go back to the slides to talk about the um, features on the uh, new system. You got it. Give us just one moment as we transition back over. Okay. 
Tech. Thank you very much, Bill, for that live demonstration. Uh, in just a few minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll take some questions and answers. But before we do that, we want to give you a glimpse into some of the new features in version 7. Bill, yeah, over to you okay. to cover these next. All right, so these are real quick um, things, uh, but I did want to let you know on a cadastral map, you can see obviously uh, that there is a lot of gray area uh, around the country uh, that we don't have an inventory uh, of data viewing or data download sites. So there is, uh, you can see the highlight in red at the bottom there, submit new information or make a correction. Uh, we've built a new form tool into the system that will allow anyone to add their information to the system. It's actually moderated by myself and the system developer, uh, so it won't automatically go in, but we will validate it, and if it's a good link, we'll go ahead and add it into the system so you can be added there. Next slide. Uh, another thing is uh, that we have developed a, a form to enter information about GIS applications, software applications that you've written, uh, if you're willing to share them with others. And most people put their information up into GitHub, uh, but what we're providing, again, is a form tool that will have, uh, like the application category, it might be Homeland Security or Natural Resources or any type of feature. Uh, the application name, a URL where somebody can go and find that application and then a description of it. And all of this is entered into keyword searches. So when you come in and are looking for applications, you'll be able to find them if somebody has entered their information and basically inventoried their application. Next slide. Okay, and this is a, a new feature. Uh, we, I said before, we already have a harvest capability that was built on the XML file structure, which is extensible uh, markup language, I think. Um, but now the world is moving to JSON, uh, which uh, is machine readable and readable by a person. Uh, I personally think the file format's a train wreck when I read it, but it's a very organized file uh, format, and uh, machines do very well with it. And so we are importing this JSON data, and that's an example on the right of what it looks like and just repeating records over into the system. And the important thing here is that uh, a lot of the systems now have their map services that they can export JSON data, which will include a title for that map service. So when you have a map service for a particular data layer, and it might be fire hydrants, it will show up in this JSON and we can convert it to a data record in our system that will identify itself as a map service that you'll automatically be able to connect over to. Uh, so again, this is coming up in the next version. Uh, we're in the last stages of quality testing now. Uh, and that might be it, but uh, next slide. Oh, one other thing is that all of the user screens are being rewritten in Bootstrap, uh, which basically Bootstrap is uh, a way to get dynamic resizing and feature location uh, on small screens. So if you're using your cell phone or an iPad or something like that, uh, Bootstrap is the you know um, programming that we do uh, on top of the basic system to allow you to use those mobile devices. And I do believe that's the last slide. Excellent. Yes, that is the last slide. So what we've provided here, thank you very much, Bill, for, for both the live demonstration and also the look into the, the features that will be coming out in the in the August timeframe, and that's August of this year, so in just a couple of months, essentially. And I do want to highlight that, especially for those of you that are joining us today that might be new to the GIS inventory, this is really a valuable way for you guys to start getting involved. Now is a great time. Not only can you inventory and share the information about your data, but also about your GIS applications. And some of that can be very, very valuable for mutual aid as well. Uh, and, and one point that I want to also make mention here before we open it up for questions and answers is that 
as you can see, obviously, the GIS inventory is certainly valuable to you as a user as you might support your first responders when they're going to be deployed for mutual aid, but also for your own community. So by participating in the GIS inventory and inventorying your own data in the system, you are increasing the preparedness of your own community. So when other responders and other public safety agencies come into your community to provide support when an incident occurs, they have access and they know what data and information you have available in your community, in your agency, so that they can equip their responders to support you better. And I just, I want to echo that key message here in terms of the importance of participation um, in the GIS inventory and the value of it um, for you all. So provided here is a link to the GIS inventory. Most of what Bill shared with you is publicly available, meaning it's not, does not require a login. You certainly did see the components and in order to actually participate in inventory your data and information, you would want to generate your own login credentials. If you have any other questions or you need uh, additional assistance or would like a, a WebEx for your community to start getting uh, onto the GIS inventory and uh, populating your data, you can certainly reach out to Phil directly at this uh, email address. And with that, I'd like to go into some questions and answers. Uh, we've had a few questions that have come up, and I'm going to actually start here at the top. If you can just bear with me, we've had quite a number of questions come in in the, in the last few moments. Great, one of the first questions that we have is from uh, Don Petit, and I believe that there's a number of others with probably a similar question, and that is how is the GIS inventory incorporated uh, HSIP data, gold or freedom? Does the data in the GIS inventory ever get integrated into HSIP products? So it's kind of a two questions in one. Um, Bill, would you like to take a cut at answering that question for us today? Um, sure. Um, if you're not familiar with HSIP, it's the Homeland Security um, Infrastructure Program, I think. And it's a series of about 450 data layers that are available uh, in two different sets. One of them is gold, which is restricted access, and one of them is freedom or public. Uh, and it's going to become more public uh, here in the next few months. But those data layers are um, developed uh, by a large consortium in the federal government working with quite a few other entities, as well as some pub uh, privately produced data that's licensed in the system. Uh, we do not um, inventory those ourselves uh, and bring them in. Uh, to the extent that they have um, metadata records, uh, for that in the one of the existing formats, JSON or CSDGM, we could import them, but we don't initiate those imports. It's up to the user community to do it. Uh, one point here that's important is that there is a national system called data.gov, which feeds the geospatial platform at the federal level. Uh, I believe they have inventoried whatever they feel is public data into that system and therefore is available on geospatial platform and some number of those data sets, I believe it might be as many as 130, uh, will be made public on the geospatial platform that you can connect to uh, sometime this year, uh, if I understood correctly uh, what the plans are. So we don't necessarily, um, we don't duplicate that work or effort uh, in the system. Uh, we are there for people that are not supporting actively that data.gov or geospatial platform effort. And we provide our information over to those. Uh, in some cases, you might want to go also over to the geospatial platform and connect to see what resources are available. And in fact, that was in that um, more information over on the right hand, upper right hand corner with those various websites that I talked about, uh, we did have data.gov and geospatial platform linkages in there with an explanation of what they are. Excellent. Thank you very much for that response, Bill. And I think the important point is, is while there is some level of integration there with data.gov, um, I think that sort of echoes also the importance uh, of 
local and state and county and other folks actually participating in the GIS inventory and publishing information about their data sets and, as well as their GIS applications. The next question we have is, uh, is the GIS inventory for web services only or is it also for static data? Is there a limit to the amount of data that can be pulled in from a given state? Um, we do not host data through the GIS inventory. It's an inventory of data and web services. Uh, so what we do is when you click through, uh, you first you locate your data uh, using the search tools and the maps and things that I showed you today. When you get to those forms that I brought up, you'll typically see a link back uh, to the host uh, site. Uh, in some cases, there will be a direct like FTP link. Uh, and we also identify, and I should have shown it, uh, but there is an icon usually in each of the data layer searches that will show you that something's available as a map service and it will be highlighted uh, if it actually is a map service. Uh, then you can click through and directly access that map service and connect over to it, but we do not host the data in the GIS inventory. That's uh, almost impossible because when you try and do that, uh, everybody is updating their data sets uh, and you have to constantly, you know, move data through the system and the amount of storage would be phenomenal. Uh, so we yeah. do not try and store data. We are an inventory system. Yeah, and I, I just want to mention a couple of valuable points on that end uh, is that also the fact that it's not a storage system means that you want the most accurate, most recent, most up-to-date version of that data. You're going to get that from the data owner who has published the information about that data on the GIS inventory. Uh, so part of the benefit of that is that it keeps the information and ensures that when you do get the data, if you get access to it, it will be the most current version and it won't be quickly out of date. Um, so that kind of goes to another question that we received, which was, could you review how we download the GIS layers? So I just want to echo um, Bill's point here in that the inventory doesn't actually populate those layers. It provides you information about the data that's available. So, so say in your community or in your agency, you have a GIS specialist or you even have a firefighter who is now taken on the GIS role within your agency, they would actually publish those records about the data that they have and they maintain that might be valuable to support neighboring jurisdictions uh, for any type and scale of incident, um, just as an example. But they wouldn't actually publish the data itself into the GIS inventory. It's kind of like, you know, if you think about a public library and you go in, you've got two options. You can ask the librarian where a book is or you can go to the card catalog. So since you can't uh, know who that person is, you have to ask about the data set, typically. Uh, you've got the card catalog in front of you and you can effectively search that card catalog and find out where that book is that you want. So that's kind of the analogy to what we do. Excellent. Um, now we have received a few other questions. If folks have any outstanding questions, please feel free to email them to Bill or myself, Rebecca Harned. Uh, my email is currently up on the screen now and I'm happy to compile all questions and get them over to Bill. The other thing I will make mention of this presentation will be available in a PDF version on our website along with a recording of today's session. So please check back and we will send you an email about when that will be available. Excellent. And I believe uh, those are all the questions that we have so far today that we're able to cover. It is now uh, just past 3 o'clock um, and I just want to check, Bill, do you have any last words for the participants today before we close out? No, just feel free to contact me uh, if you have any questions and again, we can arrange uh, training programs on specific features, especially the harvesting, which uh, is a little more complex uh, that would automate uh, your ability to move information into the system. So we're glad to uh, accomplish, you know, special training programs. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. And, and Tony, are there any last words of wisdom that you would like to share with everyone from your experience in the field and in, in using the GIS inventory? 
Um, just share, 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 and um, help where you can. That's the key. It's it's really about you know viewing all this as one big community and uh, working together. Excellent. Thank you, Tony and Bill, very much for your time today and really the very valuable information that was provided today. We hope all the participants uh, gained something important here and, and will hopefully start to, to get into the GIS inventory and start to participate and, and share information about their data as well as searching and discovering the data and information that's out there by their neighboring communities. So we encourage you all to, to get started um, as soon as today with the GIS inventory. And with that, thank you everyone. And this concludes our virtual training on the use of the GIS inventory for mutual aid planning and data sharing. Thank you, everyone.